Hello everybody, welcome to Romney for the wonderful Christmas celebration here in town. It's great to see everybody out, the weather's cooperating, I thank you all for that. Thank Mr. Lincoln for that. <laughs> welcome to Taggart Hall. This is the property of the Fort Mill Ridge Foundation. Um, we are very happy to see all the people show up today and participate in the celebration of Christmas, uh, give us an opportunity to talk about a little history. As you know, Romney is a very historic town. I'm not going to go into introducing each of the three speakers that are going to be talking with you today. They are going to do that. But our mission is the preservation of the Civil War trenches, the Fort Mill Ridge trenches over um, on Fort Mill Ridge just outside of Romney. We have a Civil War Museum inside uh, the uh, visitor center here um, that uh, we would love for you guys to take a look at. And <laughs> I, I never thought that we'd be competing with a with a public program, but that was awesome. <laughs> so we're going to do the best and keep the the uh, uh, livelihood uh, going. Good afternoon. I am Cornelius Peak McDonald. I am the youngest daughter of Humphrey and Anna McDonald, and I have 12 brothers and sisters. When it came time for me to be baptized, my mother wanted to name me Olivia. My father wanted to name me Cornelia, after his old girlfriend. I am best known for keeping a diary during the Civil War, and today I will be sharing bits of my diary with you, uh, especially pertaining to, to Christmas time. I am the second wife of Colonel Agnes McDonald of the 7th Virginia Cavalry. He's a lawyer, he is 23 years my senior, and he had nine children when we were married. His oldest child is five years younger than I am. We were married in Missouri and lived there for a short time, and then we moved to Romney, Virginia. My husband was a lawyer, and so we lived on Main Street. Uh, he inherited the house from his first wife's family, and we later sold it to the Davises. The house that you know is quite a mansion. We had two rooms. We had some of his nine children living with us there, and I gave birth to a few of my children there. So we were kind of snug. We then moved into Kaiser, and um, ironically, one of the children that was born there later was held prisoner by the Yankees in that exact house. I'm gonna start with Christmas of 1861. By this point, my husband and I had moved into Winchester, Virginia. Um, we were one of the larger landowners in Hampshire County um, and one of the richest people in Hampshire County. And I tell you that so you can see how my life changed over the course of a few years. I read from my diary. The effects of the Civil War were already being felt in Winchester, but right now it was not affecting my family. We had not met the Yankees, and the town was not occupied, and there was still plenty of food around. Early in the day, Dr. and Mrs. McGuire prepared a holiday dinner. I do not know what was on her menu, but I'm sure there was a vast variety of dishes. I can only imagine her disappointment when the general took little delight in the spread. Stonewall ate simply, just cornbread and buttermilk. We spent Christmas doing things like we had done in the past, like reading Clement Moore's A Visit from St. Nicholas. We also read Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. And then we gathered around the piano and sang songs such as Deck the Halls and Oh Come All You Faithful. We even sang Jingle Bells, even though that's not a Christmas song. We did decorate a Christmas tree that year and had popcorn, small gifts, and treats for the children. We even put candles on it. Later that night, we gave a party for the Stonewall Brigade. 
that was the last time that our home had a happy party. My husband left Winchester in March of 1863, and I want to read you the first entry into my diary that I was keeping for him. March 1862. On the night of March 11th, 1862, the pickets were in town. Part of the army was already gone, and there were hurried preparations and hasty farewells. Sorrowful faces turning towards those they loved best that they were leaving, perhaps forever. At one o'clock, the long toll beat, and soon the heavy tramping of feet were marching away. The rest of the night was spent in violent fits of weeping, and the thoughts of being left in what might happen before the army we, that we would see them again. I had a terrible fear of the coming morning, for I knew with it would come the dreaded enemy. Life that year was, was really hard. Um, we very soon had no way to light our homes because candles were being allowed down into the south. Uh, we really quickly ran out of food uh, and material. We would use anything we could to make clothing for our children. We made it out of curtains and tablecloths. And come November, I noticed that my children were still outside without any shoes on. So I took up the carpeting in the house and made boots. Um, so you, as you can imagine, Christmas of 1863 was not nearly as happy. Again, I want to read from my diary of what happened. December 23rd. In the afternoon, I became anxious for myself. Two cavalrymen on their way through the yard stopped and took my turkey. It had been dressed and hung on a low branch for the morrow. They walked a few steps before I realized what had taken place, and with the consciousness of loss came the remembrance that it, the remembrance of the strike that I had to go through to get that turkey how I had spent six dollars and I had sent a man miles on horseback to get it so that we could have a pleasant Christmas dinner. With this recollection came the inspiration to try to recover it. So I flew after him and in a commanding tone I demanded my property back. The man laughed and told me I had no right to it. It was being confiscated by the United States. Very well, I said. I will go to camp with it, and I will go to your commanding officer. And he gave it up, and I triumphantly returned to my kitchen. Unfortunately, this triumph was very short-lived because on December 24th, I'll continue from my diary, in the kitchen all day making rust cakes. For those that don't know, rust cakes are sort of what you would call Melba toast. Somebody told me that there were robbers in my kitchen carrying off my things. I continue. One of them took a tray of cakes and I turned to rescue them. And my Mary, my servant, was pulling on my sleeve and showing me that they were carrying something else off. And I turned to him and then another one see something else until I was just wild. At last, Mary said, Miss Cornelia, they've got your rust cakes. A man had opened the stove and taken the pan out of the oven. As a fit of heroism seized me, I darted after him. I caught him by the collar and I held him tight till he dropped my cakes. She managed to stay in Winchester until May of that year. And by that point, the union had taken over, her, taken over my house as a hospital. And there were men coming in and out. And I was feeling very crowded. And it was really having an effect on my children. So one of my sons was old enough then to join the army. And so he left. And the other seven children went with me 
um, as we started out to go towards Lexington. Um, we made it as far um, as the Amherst Courthouse, and I received a note that my husband had been a prisoner of war, and he was so ill that he, they were letting him go. And so I was going to meet him in, in Richmond. Uh, I want to continue from my diary um, to tell you just a little bit of what that was like. I couldn't believe it when I first saw him. He was a wreck. He was worn. His hair had turned snow white. He was unable to move from his chair. And he would not let me leave him for a moment. And his poor sad eyes followed me everywhere. During this time we were staying in Richmond, we decided that we would settle in Lexington. It was at this point that he received the news that he would not be receiving any of his pay uh, that, we, that he had earned because he was not going back to the Army at that point. Uh, so at this point we were homeless and penniless. I sold some of my clothing and some of my jewelry and with that $65, I moved the children to Lexington. There, I had a little bit of better luck. Uh, someone wanted a school teacher, so for the, they let me use their house to live in, and I would teach school. Their neighbors also wanted a teacher, so I was even able to make a little bit of money. Um, we were getting settled in. My husband gets well enough, goes back to the Army, uh, and then he is captured again. Once again, he is ill, but not receiving any medical attention or getting any medicine, and so he is released. And he made it as far as wheeling. Um, I couldn't leave at that moment because I was teaching school and had the seven children. Um, but in October, I had this dream, and I want to, again, I'll read it from my diary. In October, I had an odd dream. It startled and greatly distressed me. I dreamt that he, my husband, was going to get married and that the preparations were going on for the wedding. And I came into the room and I saw him sitting, on a, sitting at a long white table with a white cloth. And on the table was a green wreath. There was nothing else on it. When I had the stream, it distressed me so that I decided that I would go to Wheeling. And it took me about three weeks to get there. Uh, I will continue from my diary of what had happened, and this would have been December 1st. Mr. Green met me at the door and stood there rubbing his hands and looking at me. Soon, Mrs. Holliday came out of the room, and, it, and a, her unusual, unthinking way pointed to an open door and asked me to go in there. I went in, and the first object I saw was my husband's corpse, stretched on a white bed and a large green wreath around his head. Um, how familiar that wreath looked. That was our last Christmas during the war. Um, the war, when it came to spring of that year, we realized that the war would soon be ending and that we would try to pick up our, our lives from there. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. First, I'd like to apologize to Mrs. McDonald for that turkey. <laughs> Just can't watch conflagration that size, but that was, I'm glad she was able to retrieve it. I was asked to share some Christmas letters from soldiers. I found one particular tome called Dear Esther. Now this is just one soldier, but he wrote at least 300 letters to his wife and two daughters, uh, Olivia and Viola. He's a Pennsylvania man, part of the Ringgold Cavalry, a volunteer unit. You might compare it to Mosby's Raiders in the South, but 
They've been around since the Mexican War. Ringgolds showed themselves well down in Mexico City. In fact, their, their leader, Captain Ringgold, who formed them, was actually killed there, working out a new maneuver he had tried. <laughs> but they held together until the Civil War broke out, and of course with younger members. They wanted to join the cavalry in Pennsylvania, and the Pennsylvanians wouldn't take them. They said, we've got enough cavalry units, we don't need you. So they came down to Western Virginia, talked to the new governor, Francis Pierpont, of the provisional government of Western Virginia. And he was more than happy to receive them aboard. So they rode their horses into Grafton. They assessed the worth of the horse. In case he was lost in battle, they would pay him back for the horse. But they all were mustered in to the Union Army there in Grafton. And he began his tenure. And I found in this book a number of letters at Christmas time. I'll start with the earliest one. And, and these are from various sites around the area. The first one was from uh, Romney, Camp Keys, it was called. Camp Keys on December 22nd, 1861. He starts, Dear Esther, of course that's his wife, the namesake of the book. I received your letter you wrote last Monday. I was sorry to hear of our children not being well. Your letter was handed to me while on horseback. I was carrying the dispatch to the pickets. I glanced over it, intending to read it when I returned, but I'm sorry to tell you, I lost it. A typical husband, right? You, Give him something and he misplaces it. <clears throat> I still have the one Viola wrote. Viola was his 11-year-old daughter at that time. I would like it if the children would learn to sing. Oh, to try to get these children to sing. We could not spend $5 any better. If they're well enough, send them. I'm pleased to hear they're learning fast. Viola writes a very pretty letter. I hope by this time they're able to go to school. I think there will be several of our boys go home on furlough before long. I can't expect one for some time, yet nor do I wish it unless some of you get sick. My health is good and we have not much to do. I had intended to have sent the last letter and some papers by David Jenkins, but he went off and forgot them, so I sent it by mail. The magazines I'll send some other time. Sergeant took one small parcel. I expect he stopped and gave it to you. You did not say how much money I sent you. I expect it's all right. I'm doubtful if you ever get any more from the state. Does this sound familiar? From the state, they have got as many soldiers as they want, so they can take the bait off the hook and let us nibble at the bare hook. Tell me, do you have your teeth yet? This woman wasn't that old. How is your father? How is Joanne getting along? The fears of attack on this place has died away. There's very little camp music going. I've not yet commenced the stable. It's put off as they don't know themselves whether they will stay or not. Things is very uncertain. Oh, I should explain that. Uh, Ogwier Dobbs was a carpenter. He was 28, 29 years old. He was a carpenter when he joined up with the Ringgold Cavalry. So he was a pretty important fellow. He could build things for them and bridges and things like that. So he said, we haven't started on the stable here in Romney yet. Well, they have a pretty nice one across the way there. So they finally got it done, it looks like. Um, he says, it's raining a little. I expect the weather will change to cold. We will move into our tents tomorrow. I was glad to hear Viola tell how they made the old house rattle. Got those kids to sing. And I wish they would keep it up. Christmas will soon be here, but I expect old Chris Kringle won't be along. This war will keep him off. Tell me if Buffington has brought you a hog. Tell Cos Smith I sent a pistol by Jim Lynn. Now, that was 1861. Ogwe are writing from Camp Keys in Romney. I'm going to skip 62 because there's a poem there I'd like to finish with. It's very touching. But in the 63, this is written Christmas evening from Petersburg, not Richmond, West Virginia. 
He's up the river now in Petersburg. He says, and he's writing to Viola and uh, his other daughter, Olivia. He says, dear children, this is Sunday, very cold and freezing. I'm comfortable by the fire. The last letter I got from your mother and I, I answered it. I told her about the company going to Cumberland. Well, part of them are gone. The rest is not yet returned from the scout with Averill. I have not yet made up my mind whether or not to go. I'm comfortable fixed here, and I think I would be comfortable in Cumberland, but I like to stay here very well. I know he always puts two R's in the word very. Whatever he does, he does it very well, very fast, very comfortable. Perhaps I will go about the first of next month. There will be a big Christmas dinner here with the 1st Virginia Regiment. Now that's Northern. 1st Virginia Regiment. There is 24 ladies on the road from Wheeling bringing us nice things along. I am invited to take a dinner at Mr. Lambert's, a citizen living here, and also at the regiment. You see, men haven't changed at all. <laughs> So you see, we're going to have a good time, and I hope you will have a merry time. I sent two dollars to you, girls, in a letter which you must spend at Christmas. I'll send one more for fear you did not get the first one. I have thought of writing you a long letter and giving you advice and so on, but I think you can get along without it. I don't like too much lecturing. Take note of that, dads. I send the two verses of the song you requested. If I go to Cumberland, I'll let you know as soon as I make up my mind. I will know when the rest of the company comes back. I like to be near our company, and I'll have to be with them by the 10th of next month. If I expect any pay, I expect Mother will think I might send her a present. But you must tell her I will sometime. And if you get the two dollars I sent, she may have this one. Get a dollar for Christmas, ladies. I wonder if St. Nick will be at our house this winter to fill the stockings. Your papa, Anjir Dobbs. And then this last reading, a couple letters here. He was in Martinsburg, and he got word that he was needed in Cumberland to assist General Kelly, who's of McNeil's Rangers fame, if you remember that story. So he made his way to Cumberland with some troopers, and from Cumberland, they went on up to New Creek Station, which we now call Kaiser. So, from New Creek Station in 1864, he writes this letter, and it's called Christmas Gift. Dear Esther, the weather has been so cold, we've been so busy fixing up quarters, I've had no time or place to write. It is some warmer, but plenty of snow. I've been to Moorfield on a scout, and there is another gone out today. I've been sleeping with Nathan in his quarters till I got a place of my own. The Rebs burned up everything here, and we had to send to Cumberland and buy boards, and it cost me five dollars. Seems a little tough. We're compelled to spend our money for quarters. We have our little tents, but they're a poor thing. Edith sent Nathan a box of provisions, which I shared with him. It was a nice Christmas gift. We were five days coming here, and I slept on the snow seven nights. One night it snowed and it rained, and to be sure, we got like Susie Vandegraaff when she was baptized. In other words, he was soaked. Well, we got dry again, and I'm well and able for our rations. I have not yet heard whether you received the two records of our company or the hundred dollars I sent by McDonough, but I hope you have. We expect to be paid next month. Captain Hart offered to appoint me as a corporal. I thanked him for the honor he wished to confer on me. I respectfully declined to accept it. I must jump higher than that, or not jump at all. He says he'll try to get me to be the artificer. That is, the carpenter of the regiment. I don't know whether we're entitled to one or not. I, I still have $25, which I may need this winter. I don't like to be without some. It's a good standing friend in need. So it's always good to have some cash on hand. Here's a little one that involves a cat. 
Christmas evening, 19, 1863 in Petersburg. Dear Esther and our children, I wish you a happy Christmas. I've enjoyed myself well, considering I'm away from home. We had a nice dinner and good company. The boys are all near gone out tonight to different places in their regiments, but I have a nice wood fire. While the kittens is scampering around, the cricket chirps in the hearth. I expect you think I'm lonely, but I'm not lonely when thinking of the loved ones at home. I have to stop to watch the pranks of my kitten. I had intended to tell the children about it, but I forgot. Since I've been here, an old cat had five of them behind the bake oven. She was so wild I couldn't do anything with her. She carried one off and left the rest to perish. One day she brought the one back, nearly perished. I made a nice warm place for it and placed milk and food for her. In time she became very tame and I brought them in the house and she likes to stay. The kitten is large enough to play and I often have a play with it. So tonight he's doing it playing by himself around my legs. I made some taffy today and I gave it to the children who could catch one. I knew Olivia is very fond of taffy and I wonder if she made some. Well, the weather is frosty, but not severe. There's no mud or snow, and all I see appears to enjoy themselves very well. So, you'll note that he says he's happy as long as he can remember his family, and how they're doing well, and the good times at home. This last piece I want to read to you was written by a soldier in the Army of Northern Virginia. In fact, his name was William Gordon McCabe, and he must have been a cavalry man too, because it mentions, he mentions his saber swinging from a bough of a tree that's hanging above where he's camped. He's got his saber hung up there and it glistens in the firelight. He also was somewhat of a prodigal son, apparently, because he talks about him leaving home and coming back and how glad his mother was. But then he gets to the part where there's no mother anymore. Let me share it with you. It says this was written up in both southern and northern newspapers. It became a bit famous in its time. It's, it's called Christmas Night of 62. The wintry blast goes wailing by. The snow is falling overhead. I hear the lonely sentries tread. Distant watchfires light the sky. Oh, I'd also like to let you know, this is in quatrain. You've got A, B, B, and A. The first and fourth lines of each stanza rhyme, and the middle two lines rhyme. So I'll, I'll read that again, so be sure you catch that. The wintry blast goes wailing by. The snow is falling overhead. I hear the lonely sentries tread, and distant watchfires light the sky. Dim forms go flitting through the gloom. The soldiers cluster round the blaze to talk of other Christmas days and softly speak of home and home. My saber swinging overhead gleams in the watchfire's fitful glow while fiercely drives the blinding snow and memory leads me to the dead. My thoughts go wandering to and fro, vibrating twixt the now and then. I see the low-browed home again, the old hall wreathed with mistletoe. Sweetly from the far off years comes born the laughter, faint and low, the voices of the long ago. My eyes are wet with tender tears. I feel again the mother's kiss. I see again the glad surprise that lighted up the tranquil eyes and brimmed them o'er with tears of bliss. As rushing from the old hall door, she fondly clasped her wayward boy, her face all radiant with the joy. She felt to see him home once more. My saber swinging on the bow, gleams in the watchfire's fitful glow, while fiercely drives the blinding snow, a slant upon my side and brow. There's not a comrade here tonight, but knows that loved ones far away on bended knee this night we'll pray, God bring our darling from the fight. But there are none to wish me back. For me, no yearning prayers arise. The lips are mute, close the eyes. My home is in the bivouac. So there's an orphan camping out in the snow on that Christmas Eve. 
Anyway, thank you for letting me share some letters from old Aguirre here to his wife Esther. Incidentally, he made it through the war. She made it through the war. Both daughters made it through the war. So his story has a happy ending. Thank you.